Greetings from the Manuscripts Division of Moreland Spingarn Research Center. My name is Brooklyn King, and I'm a junior English major, secondary education and photography double minor from Capitol Heights, Maryland. I am one of the manuscript interns here at Moreland. To celebrate Black History Month, the center has curated a weekly program titled Moreland Mondays. Each Monday, different divisions create unique ways to tell stories of Black history and do so with research done in-house here at Moreland. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Manuscripts Division. In 1974, the Manuscripts Division was organized into four departments, Manuscripts, Prints and Photographs, Oral History, and Music. The resources of the Manuscript Division combine to provide important insight into the growth and development of Black families, organizations, social and religious consciousness, and the continuing struggle for civil rights and human justice. Arts and movement are a constant within the African diaspora. Often these components of life serve as the defining tools toward the establishment of international movements of popular culture. For more than Mondays, the Manuscript Division will highlight documents and artifacts that preserve and promote the tangible legacy of the arts and movements held in our collection. These specific collections showcase the mechanisms of resistance Black people have created. They highlight how Black people have defined the narrative of Blackness through artistic expression and manifested them through kinetics. We hope you enjoy our segment of Moreland Mondays. Hello all, my name is Rashad Freeman. I'm a sophomore economics student here at Howard University and a student intern at the Moreland Spring Art Research Center. And today I'll present on the Harry Bauman Vaudeville Photographs Collection. The Harry Bauman Vaudeville Collection is full of organizations, groups, and individuals that perform their art through the vaudeville movement from the 1880s to the 1930s. Vaudeville is a theatrical genre that was coined in France and brought to America, where it was used in entertainment to show the fusion of art disciplines from past and present. Vaudeville was meant to show cultural diversity in arts through the 20th century. However, many talented black artists were excluded from the majority of these shows. In addition, many white entertainers mocked and mistreated African Americans in their own vaudeville performances with blackface and other stereotypes. This didn't stop entertainers from being resilient and sticking their feet in the door in their various art forms. Black artists, entertainers, and showmen came together to form what is called and known as today as Black Vaudeville. Black Vaudeville became an artistic outlet for Black Americans that allowed them to showcase African American culture and their unseen talents, as well as parody their own mistreatment through irony. Before black exploitation in the 1970s came black Volvo in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Next, I'm going to highlight a few key figures in this Volvo movement. First is Bill Robinson. Bill Robinson was a pioneer in the black Volvo movement and a world renowned tap dancer. He earned over $2 million in his lifetime, the most of any African American entertainer in the 20th century. However, he tragically died penniless due to his acts of charity with his friends, and also his lifetime gambling habits. His story and inability to retain the world record-breaking wealth he earned demonstrates the importance of preserving and collecting photographs. Without testimony, writing, art, and photographs, the stories of great black individuals can go unremembered. Next is Ida Forcine, known as the queen of the cakewalk. She was a vaudeville dancer who toured Europe and Russia. She was named one of the 12 best dancers in the world by Langston Hughes, and she was also a part of the TOBA Vaudeville circuit, which traveled with singers all along the East Coast. To conclude, the Vaudeville collection has affected me personally by teaching me about the numerous Black legends that went under the radar for their artwork, which ultimately affected the integration of today's Hollywood. Hello, my name is Bria Johnson, one of the Manuscripts Librarians at Moreland Spingarn Research Center. And today I'll be presenting on David C. Driscoll from the Lois Maylou Jones Collection. David C. Driscoll was a legendary African-American artist and art historian. Driscoll completed an art program at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine in 1953. 
He received a bachelor's degree in art from Howard University in 1955 and a master's in fine arts from Catholic University of America in 1962. He then explored postgraduate studies in art history at the Netherlands Institute for the History of Arts in The Hague. His most influential contributions are the exhibition and catalog for the groundbreaking Two Centuries of Black American Art, which opened in 1976 at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and traveled to museums across the country. In 1977, after teaching at Talladega College, Howard University, and Fisk University, Driscoll joined the Department of Art at the University of Maryland, where he remained until his retirement in 1998. The University of Maryland opened the David C. Driscoll Center for the Study of Visual Arts and Culture of African Americans and the African Diaspora in 2001 to celebrate his legacy as an artist and art historian. In 1993, Driscoll was honored with an award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In December of 2000, Driscoll received the National Humanities Medal. In 2005, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia, established the David C. Driscoll Prize, the first national award to honor and celebrate contributions to the field of African American art by a scholar or artist. In 2007, David C. Driscoll was elected as a national academician by the National Academy. In 2016, Driscoll received a Lifetime Legacy Award from the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science. For more information about our collections, please visit Digital Howard. Thank you. My name is Jamie Lee, and I am a manuscript associate with the Moreland Spingarn Research Center. I selected items from the Elaine Locke collection where his ideas as a philosopher resonated with me because of his views on civil rights. Elaine Locke was a writer, educator, and a philosopher. In 1907, he graduated from Harvard University with degrees in English and philosophy. He was honored as a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Society and became the first African American to be selected as a Rhodes Scholar to the University of Oxford. He was later admitted to Hertford College, where he studied literature, philosophy, Greek, and Latin from 1907 to 1910 and attended the University of Berlin in 1910, where he studied philosophy. Upon arriving here at Howard, he served as an assistant professor and ultimately became chair of the philosophy department. Known as the Dean of the Harlem Renaissance, he wrote several books that referenced that era, including The New Negro, which was created in the concept of race building. He wrote a piece titled The Negro in Three Americas, and one segment struck me in particular. He acknowledges that race relations in America was affected due to the Negro population being only 10% of the total population, though their percentage increases in other areas around the globe and mixed with other races and cultures. He makes the assertion that the lives of most persons of Negro blood and descent in America, directly or indirectly, are still seriously affected by the cultural, social, and economic consequences of slavery. He also shares that so large a proportion of American Negroes enjoy less than their proper share of democracy. Even though this piece was published in 1944, this continues to resonate in 2023, nearly 80 years later. I was born in the early 1960s, so I was quite young while Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was still in the forefront fighting for civil rights for African Americans. In fact, I had just turned six years old when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. I was still in kindergarten. At that grade level, we had not been taught about Dr. King. Since then, it became imperative for me to learn about and become more in tune with what civil rights mean to me as an African-American in our day-to-day -day living. It distresses me that our civil rights continue to be a struggle after many years, Though our incomes, our social status, our quality of life, whatever the case may be, have greatly improved. It feels that even though we have pushed that advancement needle over the years, the system continues to attempt to hold us back, such as our voting rights constantly being challenged, our 44th President Barack Obama, who became the first African-American U.S. president and also served two terms, being vilified and disrespected by his fellow members of Congress at every turn and dealing with the nonstop police brutality in this country, to name a few. 
but it is also enlightening to see just how much insight Mr. Locke had into the lives of African Americans and through his writings and the arts, attempted to champion them in demanding their civil rights over the years. My name is Jacob Duncan, and I am a sophomore nutritional sciences major from Harlem, New York. I am also a student intern within the Manuscript Division of the Moreland Springard Research Center. I am presenting on the Clarence Cameron White Collection. Before diving into the collection, it is important to know who Clarence Cameron White was. He was an African-American composer and violinist that lived from August 10, 1880 to June 30, 1960. He is a founding member of the National Association of Negro Musicians and is best known for his dramatic works such as the music from the play Tambor and the opera Wanga. In his collection, Box 12 is filled with documents from the play Wanga. I decided to focus on two artifacts, one being a promotional pamphlet and the other is a set mock-up. first artifact is a stimulating pamphlet that shows the cast of Wanga, costumes from the play, a brief description of the story, as well as critic reviews. The first page of this document is especially enticing, with bold lettering and exciting text, as well as rich images. The second artifact is a set mock-up using collaged images from Haiti. This shows the dedication of White to make the play accurate and culturally sensitive. Using photos of what the headdresses, foliage, and overall set design and costumes should look like, shows that White took his time and cared about the accuracy of the play. These artifacts relate to the idea of controlling the narrative because at the time of the play, the U.S. was occupying Haiti. Additionally, American media sensationalized the view of Haitian history and paid little attention to historical and cultural accuracy. Instead, they would inaccurately portray the voodoo religion and make Haitians seem primitive and violent. This play was made to take back that narrative, as well as use the connections between the yearning for civil rights for blacks in America and the use of Haiti as an example of black freedom. The play also represents the struggle of African Americans to maintain their identity in a place dominated by white cultural dominance. This is shown through the conflict of Dessalines, the main antagonist as he leaves his culture for Catholicism and is killed for it as well as the current invasion that was negatively affecting the island. This collection as a whole resonated with me because this play was produced during the time of the Harlem Renaissance, and Clarence Cameron White was deeply connected to the movement. Being from Harlem, New York, and having an affinity for the arts, civil rights, eras of change, and of course the Harlem Renaissance, it was wonderful looking through this collection. My name is Sharice Thompson. I'm a manuscript librarian, and I selected items from the Mary Rose Reeves Allen papers, which speak to me personally as a former hair salon owner and licensed cosmetologist. From 1925 until 1967, Ms. Allen served as the head of the Department of Physical Education for Women at Howard University. Physical education minded since childhood, she had read of the ancient Greeks and their philosophy of beauty in the human body and the part games and exercise play in its development. Upon being offered a position at Howard, Allen accepted it immediately, realizing that here was an opportunity to test her own theories regarding physical education's role in the life of the women. Her first impression on arriving at Howard was one that she would long remember. This predominantly black school, Allen saw for the first time the great variety of African-American types. In this variety, she saw all the basic elements of beauty in black women. However, Allen discovered that the women at Howard subscribed to the generally accepted white American norm for beauty and that those who did not meet its criteria were looked upon as being something other than beautiful. Thus, the first task which she assigned herself was that of erasing these misconceptions from the minds of her students. Through the phys ed department, Allen instilled in her students pride in their racial heritage and being through her philosophy of beauty in the human body. The curriculum consisted of a series of well-selected activities designed to develop in students an aesthetic concept and appreciation for the human body. Students learned to make their lives healthy and effective in their everyday living a fine art experience. Out of this fine art approach grew the concept of body sculpture through movement in which all physical activities became the media which a beautiful body is created. In the very beginning, dance was looked upon as the basic art form of physical education for women at Howard. In it, the phys ed department saw not only a resource for the educational, self-development needs of women, also a resource for their cultural needs. 
There was beauty to be found in rhythm and fine movement. Thus, the modern dance group was formed. MDG carried the philosophy of the Department of Phys Ed for Women to audiences throughout the East. At the university, it was a featured participant in three of the annual university-wide productions, the May Festival, Festival of Fine Arts, and the Christmas Community Program. The success of the MDG inspired the formation of Tropicano, a dance group composed of Howard students from the Caribbean who aspired to interpret through movement the beauty and culture of their native lands. In addition to sculpture through movement, the Body Aesthetics course was designed to support the idea that beauty is synonymous with health. As a result, the department established a beauty clinic, which had a twofold purpose. First, it was the laboratory for the personal development phase of body aesthetics, and secondly, it provided a personal service for women enrolled in other physical education courses. Students using the clinic received professional guidance in all phases of cosmetology. For this purpose, Allen commissioned professional consultants on HU's campus in the community and other cities to give special lectures and demonstrations, including physicians, cosmetologists, and professional educators. In conclusion, it is important to note that before segregation was declared unconstitutional in 1953, 80% of the women who taught physical education in schools for black students graduated from Howard University under the leadership of Miss Allen. Greetings, I am Leela J. Sewell Williams, Curator of Manuscript Division within Moreland Spingarn Research Center. My presentation will focus on resistance through dance, movement, and scholarship. Dr. Sherelle Berryman Johnson was the founding artistic director of the first HBCU BFA dance program here at Howard University. She served in that role from 1992 until her passing in 2010. She was the second chairperson of the now 35-year-old International Association of Blacks Dance. She was a scholar, choreographer, performer, and artistic director for images of cultural artistry. Dr. Johnson studied extensively at the Catherine Dunham Institute under the tutelage of Catherine Dunham and Pearl Reynolds. She was the first Fulbright scholar to conduct field research on secular and non-secular dance of Jamaica under the guidance of Professor Rex Nutterford from 1986 to 1987, specializing in roots and retention of African Americans in African and Caribbean cultural continuum. These are just a few of her decades of accomplishments. At the time of Dr. Johnson's passing in March 2010, arrangements were made for her papers to be donated to the center. As my dance mentor, she provided me with the privilege of preserving and organizing her tangible legacy. Dr. Johnson was about the work. She was passionate and determined to preserve and promote the narrative of the Black experience through performing arts. I consider myself an extension of her work, creating a professional and personal obligation to keep her legacy at the fore. The following slides feature a sample of her work performed in a collaborative setting with the goal of preserving and promoting culture through the arts. Kazan Art Institute Incorporated was a manifestation of Dr. Johnson's resistance to the false narrative of Blacks and dance and her resilience to provide a space to share truth through movement. Kozan Art Ensemble was founded in 1981 by a collective of actors, dancers, musicians, and visual artists to study, preserve, and communicate rich traditional artistic expression of diverse cultures. Featured on this slide is a description of how Kozan would also be used as a tool to specifically provide a space for Washington, D.C.'s high population of Black women whose arts expressions in the performance of dance had not been experienced by the general public. The Collaboration of Artists Controlling the Narrative. This program, hosted by Kozan in 1986, features the work of Jawale Jozalar, founder of Urban Bush Women, which was founded two years before this program, and legendary Dunham dancer Pearl Reynolds. This final slide records Kozan's efforts to keep the community engaged in the process of maintaining and growing the Black art narrative, as the work of the organization included training of the youth. A few of the many hats Dr. Johnson wore included the school project coordinator and writing drama coach. The efforts of Kozan Art Institute is a tangible demonstration of resistance and resilience through dance and determination recorded and preserved within the manuscript division of Moreland Spingarn Research Center. Hi. 
My name is Junius Levi Whitaker IV, and I'm a second year master's student at Howard University focusing on African diaspora with a minor in public history from Raleigh, North Carolina. Currently, I work at Moreland as a researcher, working on processing collections, creating digital repositories, and overall just doing research with the overall collections and manuscripts that we have in our division. In this image, we are provided with the flyer for All That Jazz, which is an event hosted by the Detroit Rhythmic Rollers. The Detroit Rhythmic Rollers are a black roller skating club based out of Michigan that created events like Cruise and Skate, which is a partnership with the Royal Caribbean, and created a plethora of many other endeavors that focused on traveling and skating. In my interaction with seeing this artifact, it made me realize how contemporary elements of black culture can be combined to produce anything and scholastically highlight anything as well. The fact that an intellectual collaboration of roller skating and jazz could be established shows that many other contemporary topics that may be deemed as inverse of each other can also do the same. If this was practiced more frequently, not only would it aid in more environments of academic understanding and relatability, but it will also serve as a form of resistance to shed light on cultures that may face misrepresentation and societal disregard. This painting by David Garbaldi is called Bounce Rock Skate, and it is an example of a 20th century skating environment composed of people of African descent from the OFSA or Our Family Skate Association. The Our Family Skate Association is an organization devoted to highlighting the African diaspora and roller skating while also broadcasting how people of African descent have played an essential role in the creation and development of roller skating and the many styles, aspects, and contemporary art forms that have come from it. In this artistic masterpiece, the vibrancy and the elements of the portrait provide more than just a visual representation of a roller skating environment. It is a depiction of how, in the African diaspora, there are various forms of our culture that are practiced throughout history. In my analysis of this artifact, it made me gain a sense of introspectivity because it made me realize that due to the cultural versatility of people of African descent, the ways in which we transcribe and practice our ways of lives can show in many forms a variety of different contemporary topics and ways of life, just as how the OFSA has showed through roller skating. Tom Bailey Jr. was the owner of Beekeeper Skate Products and was born in 1952 and grew up skating in the black owned ranks of Chicago. He talked about how he didn't see many black owned rinks when he left Chicago and he realized that black skaters and their unique styles did not get much representation in the skating world. Tom recalled that he could find limitless equipment for racers and artistic skaters, but nothing for him and those who skated like himself. Through extensive research in 2003, Tom Bailey developed the Beekeeper World, which was used as the finest combination of high performance polymers and micro machining to ensure that the surface of the wheel mates evenly with the skating floor and spins in tight parallel with the axle that gave him the kind of roll that he desired. Tom stated often when talking about the beekeeper roll that he named the company and the world beekeeper in honor of those skaters like himself who rolled with the beat of the music. So to the grave, he considered himself, I'm a beekeeper and I roll with the beat. What stood out to me in my analyzation of this artifact is that roller skating was combined with academia to develop a new scholastic understanding of a topic for others. In my own personal research, I try to combine elements of African diaspora that are deemed as forms of entertainment or contemporary, but actually provide a wide degree if we actually give them the same intellectual reciprocation that we would any other scholastic topic. And I believe through artifacts like the Beekeeper World that we get a better understanding of not only how African diaspora has played a part in so many different ways, but also how so many different inventions, creations, and intellectual thoughts come from African diaspora. Hello, my name is Rebecca Schiffman. I am an art history major, history minor from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I am the museum intern here at Moreland Spin Garden. The first artifact from Moreland's collection I would like to highlight is Samuel Coleridge Taylor's Death Cast. Coleridge Taylor was born in Holborn, England in 1875. At age 15, he enrolled in the Royal College of Music, where he developed from prodigy violinist into classical composer. Coleridge Taylor's compositions drew from poetry, and later, after hearing the Fisk Jubilee Singers in 1902, traditional African spirituals. This homage to his identity made him one of the most progressive composers of the 20th century. Coleridge Taylor created nearly 100 compositions during his lifetime, including 24 Negro Spirituals and Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. Death casting is a process of laying strings and plaster over the face of someone after they have died and using the strings to lift the plaster away once it has hardened. In Western traditions, death casting was used to immortalize and honor the lives of notable figures. I chose this artifact because it is one of the many objects in the collection that depict a tradition lost to time. And given the nature of the artifact, it highlights 
the emotional aspect of working with historical objects which offer an intimate view of history's leading figures. The next artifact I would like to share is Fire, a quarterly devoted to younger Negro artists. Fire was published in 1926 and was an early outlet for many visual and literary artists who gained notoriety in the 1920s and 30s. Contributors to Fire include Gwendolyn Bennett, Langston Hughes, Wallace Thurman, Zora Neale Hurston, and Aaron Douglas, as seen to the left side of the screen, exhibiting his line drawings, which dramatically counter his later style, as seen in the 1934 Aspects of Negro Life, famously displayed at the New York Public Library. The magazine includes visual art, plays, poetry, and short stories. The creators had a very clear goal in mind. As the forward puts it, searing, penetrating, far beneath the superficial items of the flesh, boiled the sluggish blood. Unfortunately, due to financial difficulties, and only nine subscribers of the periodical, only one issue was ever published, making this a rare insight into the early careers of some of history's most prophetic and creative individuals. Moreland's copy of Fire includes both signatures and handwritten notes from the contributing artists, making it an even more significant copy of a rare publication. This concludes the Manuscripts Division segment of Moreland Mondays. We hope you all enjoyed this brief history lesson and encourage you all to continue to do research with the Center. Thank you.